today, today I'm starting, I'm starting to read a new TED presentation titled "The New Generation of Computers Is Programming Itself." It's an interesting topic, and uh, actually, this presentation occurs in the form of dialogue. I will read the transcript. It's fairly fascinating. Uh, and this is my second time to read the exactly the same transcript, and、uh, I have read it once. Okay, let me start. Help me understand what machine learning is, because that seems to be the key driver of so much of excitement and also of the concern around artificial intelligence. How does machine learning work? So, artificial intelligence and the machine learning is about 60 years old and has not had a great day in its past until recently. And the reason is that today. We have reached a scale of computing and data sets that was necessary to make machines smart. So here's how it works: If you program a computer today, say your phone, then you hire software engineers that write a, a very very long kitchen recipe, like if the water is too hot, turn down the temperature; if it's too cold, turn up the temperature. Recipe are now just ten lines long. There are millions of lines long, and the model cell phone has twelve million lines of code. The browser has five million lines of code, and each bug in this recipe will cause your computer to crash. That's why a software engineer makes so much money. The new thing now is that computers can find their own rules. So instead of expert deciphering step by step. A rule for every contingency. What you do is you give the computer examples and have it enforce its own rules. A really good example is AlphaGo, which recently was won by Google. Normally, in the game playing, you would really write down all the rules, but in AlphaGo's case, the system looked over a million games and was able to enforce its own. Rules and then be the world's resetting Go champion. That's exciting because it releases the software engineer of the need of being super smart and pushes the burden towards the data. I say inflection point where this has been really possible. Every embarrassing. My thesis was about machine learning. It, it was completely insignificant. Don't read it. Because it was 20 years ago, and back then the computer was as big as a cockroach brain. Now they are powerful enough to really emulate kinds of specialized human thinking, and then the computers take advantage of the fact that they can look at much more data than people can. So I'd say AlphaGo looked at more than a million games. No human expert can ever study a million games. Google has looked at over 100 billion web pages. No person can ever study 100 billion web pages. So as a result, computer can find rules that even people can't find. So instead of looking ahead to if he does that, I'll do that. It's more saying here's what looks like a winning pattern. Here's what looks like the winning pattern. Yeah, I mean, think about how you raise children. You don't spend the first 18 years giving kids a rule for every contingency and set them free, and they have this big problem. They stumble, fall, get up, and they get slapped and spanked, and they have a positive experience, a good grade in school, and they figure it out in their own. That's happening with computers now, which makes computer programming so much easier all of a sudden. Now we don't have to think anymore. We just give them a lot of data, and so this has been key to speculate, speculate improvement in power of self-driving cars. I think you gave me an example. Can you explain what's happening here?
This is a drive of our self-driving car that we happened to have at uh, Wuda City and recently made it to spin off called Voyage. And we have used this thing called Deep Learning to train car to drive itself. And this is driving from Mountain View, California to San Francisco on El Camino Rio on rainy day with bicyclists and uh, pedestrians and 133 traffic lights. And the novel thing here is, many, many months ago, I started as a Google self-driving car team and back in the day, I looked at the world's best uh, software engineers to find the world's best rules. This is just train. We drive this road 20 times. We pull all this data into computer brain and after a few hours of processing, it comes up with the behavior that often surpasses human agility. So it becomes really easy to program it. This is 100% autonomous, about 33 miles, hour and a half. So explain it. On a big part of the program on left, you are seeing basically what computer says as the trucks and cars and those those overtaking it and so forth. So on the right side, you see the camera image, which is the main input here and is used to find lanes, other cars and traffic lights. The vehicle has a radar to do distance estimation. This is very commonly used in this kind of systems. On the left side, you see the laser diagram, where you see obstacles like trees and so on depicted by the laser. But almost all the interesting work is centering on the camera image now. We are really shifting over from precision sensors like radar and laser into very cheap commodity sensors. Camera costs less than eight, less than eight dollars. And uh, that green dot on the left thing. What's that? Is that anything meaningful? This is the look ahead point for your adaptive cruise control and it helps us understand how to regulate velocity based on how far the cars in front of you are. And so you've also got the example I think of how actual learning part take place. Maybe we can see that. Talk about this. This is an example where we post and challenge on Udacity students to take what we call self-driving car, nano degree. We give them this data set and say, hey, can you guys figure out how to steal this car? And if you look at images, it's, it's even humans. Quite impossible to get steering right. And we run a competition that said, it's a deep learning computation, AI computation and we give students 48 hours. So if you are software house like Google and Facebook, something like this costs you at least six months of work. And we think that 48 hours is great. And within 48 hours, we got 100 submissions from students and top five got it perfectly right. It drives better than I could drive on this imaginary using deep learning. And again, it's the same methodology. It's this magical thing. When you give enough data to a computer now and give enough time to comprehend the data, it finds its own rules. And so that leads to development of powerful applications in all sorts of areas. You were talking to me the other day about cancer. Can I show this video? Yeah, absolutely, please. This is cool. This is kind of insight into what's happening on a completely different domain. It's augmenting or competing. It's in eye of beholder with people who are being paid $400,000 a year. Dermatologists, highly trained specialists. It takes more than a decade of training to be a good dermatologist. And what you see here is the machine learning version of it. It's called neural network. Neural networks is a technical term for these machine learning algorithms. They have been around since 1980s. This one was invented in 1988 by a Facebook fellow called Yan Lekun. 
and this propagates data stages of what you could think of as a human brain. It's not quite the same thing, but it emulates the same thing. It goes the stage after stage. In the very first stage, it took the visual input as trust ages and rows and dots. And the next one becomes more complicated ages and shapes like the little half moons. Eventually, it's been able to really complicated concepts. Andrew M has been able to show that it's able to find cat faces and dog faces in vast amount of images. And uh, what my student team at Stanford has shown is that if you train it on 129,000 images of skin condition, including melanoma and uh, carcinomas, you can do as good a job as best human dermatologists. And to convince ourselves that this is the case, we captured an independent data set and presented it to our network and to 25 board certified Stanford level dermatologists and compared those. And in most cases, they were either on par or above performance classification accuracy of human dermatologists. You were telling me an anecdote. I think about this image right here. What happens here? What happened here? This was last uh, Thursday, and this that's a moving piece. What we've shown before and we published in Nature earlier this year was this data was showed uh, dermatologists' images and our computer program images, and can't tell when they are right. And all these images are past images. They've all been biopsy to make sure we had the correct classification. This one wasn't. This one was actually done at Stanford by one of our celebrators. The story goes that our collaborator, who's a world famous dermatologist, one of the three bites apparently, looked at this mole and said, this is not a skin cancer, and then he had the second moment where he said, well, let me just check with the ape. And he took, took out his phone and ran our piece of software, our pocket dermatologist. So to speak, the iPhone said cancer. It said melanoma. And then he was confused. He decided, okay, maybe I trust the phone a little bit more than myself. And he sent it out to a lab, get it biopsied. And it comes, came out as aggressive melanoma. I think this might be the first time that we actually found, in practice of using deep learning, an actual person whose melanoma would have gone unclassified had it not been for deep learning. I mean, this is just incredible. Okay, I will take a five minutes rest and I will post the video. And so be prepared that when I post the video, um, I will have to take some water and uh, take a good rest. I will be back in five minutes. I'm coming back. So let, let me continue. I mean, that's incredible. It feels like there'd been an instant demand for an app like this right now that you might freak out a lot of people. Are you thinking of doing this? Making an app that allows self-checking. So my inbox is flooded with cancer apps. We've heard breaking stories people. I mean, some people have had 15 uh, 10, 15, 20 melanomas removed and the scare that one might be overlooked like this one and also about I don't know flying cars and speakers in queries these days I guess my take is we need some more testing I want to be very careful it's very easy to give a flash result and impress a tight audience um, but it's more harder it's much harder to put something out that's ethical 
and if people were to use the ape and choose now to consult the assistant of a doctor because we got it wrong, I would feel really bad about it. So we are re really not. We are currently doing clinical tests, and if this clinical test comes and our data holds up, we might be able at some point to take this kind of technology and take it out of the Stanford Clinic and bring it to Intel World, places where Stanford doctor never ever set foot. And do I hear this right? So it seems like uh, what you were saying, because you are working with this army of Udacity students, and in this way you are applying a different form of machine learning that might take place in a company, which is you are combining machine learning with a form of crowd wisdom. And you are learning that something you think that could actually outperform what a company can do, even a vast company. I believe there's no instances that blow my mind, and I'm still trying to understand. When Chris is referring to is this competitions that we run, we turn them around in 48 hours, and we've been able to build self-driving cars that can drive from Mountain View, from Mountain View to San Francisco on surface streets. It's not quite on par with Google after seven years of Google work, but it's getting here. It's getting there, and it took us only two engineers and three months to do this, and the reason is we have an army of students who participate in competitions. We are not the only ones who use crowdsourcing, Uber and Didi, to use crowdsource for driving. Airbnb use crowdsourcing for hotels. And uh, there's how many examples where people do backfunding cross-sourcing on protein folding of all things, uh, the cross-sourcing. But we've been able to build this car in three months. So I'm actually rethinking how we organize the operations. Uh, how we organize corporations. We have a staff of 9,000 people who are never hired, that I never fail. I show up to work. They show up to work and I don't even know. And then submit to me maybe 9,000 answers. I'm not obliged to use any of those. End up, I pay only the winners. So I actually very cheap, cheap skit here, which is maybe not the best thing to do. But they consider it part of the education tool, which is nice. But these students have been able to produce amazing deep learning results. So yeah, the synthesis of great people and uh, great machines and learning is amazing. I mean, Gary Kasparov said in the first day of TED 2017 that the winners of chess, surprising, turned out to be the two amateur chess players in the free Medicro-ish, medicro to good computer programs that could outperform one grandmaster with one great chess player. Like it, like it was all part of the process. And it almost seems like uh, you are talking about a much richer version of that same idea. Yeah, I mean. As you follow the fantastic panels yesterday morning, the two sessions of AI, robotic overlords and human response, many, many great things were said. But one of the concerns is that we sometimes confuse what actually been done with AI with this kind of overlord threat. Will your AI develop consciousness, right? The last thing I want is for my AI to have consciousness. I don't want to come into my kitchen and have a refrigerator fall in love with the dishwasher and tell me, because I wasn't nice enough. My food is not warm. I wouldn't buy these products, and I don't want them. But truth is for me, AI has always been an augmentation of people, 
has been an augmentation of us to make us stronger. I think uh, Ka Kasparov was really correct. I've been a combination of human smarts and machine smarts that make us stronger. And the theme and machines making us stronger is as old as machines are. Hungry cultural revolution took place because it made the steam engines and farming equipment that couldn't farm by itself, that never replaced us. It made us stronger, and I believe this new wave of AI will make us much, much stronger as a human race. We'll come on to that a bit more. But just continue with the scary part of this for some people, like what feels like uh, it gets scary for people is when you have a computer that can run, rewrite its own code so it can recreate multiple copies self, try a bunch of different code versions, possible even random, and then check them out, say the goal is achieved and improved. So say the goal is to do better on intelligence tests, you know, a computer is more than really good at that. You can try a million versions of that, you might find one that was better, and then you know, repeat. So the concern is that you get some sort of runaway effect, that everything is fine on Thursday evening, and you come back to the lab on Friday morning, because the speed of computer and so forth, things have gone crazy, suddenly, suddenly. I would say this, this is a possibility, but it's a very remote possibility. So let me just translate what I heard from you. In the AlphaGo case, we have exactly the same case thing. The computer would play a compute game against itself and then learn the new rules. And what machine learning is, it's rewriting the rules. It's the rewriting of code. And I think there was absolutely no concern that AlphaGo would take over the world. It can't even play chess. No, 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 no. But now, there are all very single domain things, but it's possible to image. imagine. I mean, we just saw a computer that seemed nearly couple of passing university entrance, entrance test that can kind of, it can read and understand in the sense that we can, but it can certainly absorb all the text and maybe say increased patterns of meaning. Isn't there a chance that, as borders out, it could be different kind of runaway effect? That's where I draw the line, honestly. And the chance exists, I don't want to downplay it, but I think it's remote. And it's now the thing that's on my mind these days, because I think the big revolution is something else. Everything successful in AI to the present data has been extremely specialized and it's been thriving on single idea, which was immense of data, which was massive amount of data. The reason AlphaGo works so well is that because the massive numbers of Go plays, and AlphaGo can drive a car or fly a plane. The Google self-driving car or Audacity self-driving car thrives on Massive amount of data, it can't do anything else. It can't even control the motorcycle. It's very specific, domain-specific function. And the same is true for our cancer ape. There has been almost no progress on this thing it's called general AI. Will you go to an AI and say, hey, invent for me a special reality and, uh, uh, and strong theory. It's totally in the infancy. The reason I want to emphasize this, I say the concerns, I want to acknowledge them, but if I were to think about one thing, I would ask myself the question, what if we can take this thing, anything repetitive, and make ourselves 100 times as efficient? It so turns out, 300 years ago, we all worked in agriculture, and did farming, and did repetitive things. Today, 75% of us work in office offices, and do repetitive things. We've become spreadsheet monkeys, and not just low and drops, we've become dermatologists doing repetitive things, lawyers doing repetitive things, 
I think we are at the brink of being able to take an AI, look, look over our shoulders, and they make us maybe 10 or 15, 50 times as efficient in this repetitive, repetitive things. And that's what, what's on my mind. That sounds super exciting. The process of getting there seems a little terrifying to some people. Because once the computer can do this repetitive thing much better than the dermatologist, dermatologist, and then the driver especially, it's the thing that they talked about so much now. Suddenly millions are drop score, and you know the country is in revolution before we ever get to a more glorious aspect of of what's possible. Yeah, that's an issue, and it's a big issue. And it's pointed out yesterday morning by several guest speakers. Now, prior to me showing up on stage, I confess I'm a positive, optimistic person. And let me give you an optimistic pitch, which is, think about yourself back 3,000 years ago. You have just survived 130 years, 140 years of continuous war. None of you could read and write. There, there were no jobs that you hold today. Like investment bankers suffered under Neil TV Ultra. We would all be in the fields of farming. Now, here comes little Sebastian with the battle steam engine in his pocket, saying, Hey guys, look at this. I'm going to make you 100 times as strong, and you can do something else. And then back in the day, there was no real stage, but Chris and I hung out with the cows in the stable, and he says, I'm really concerned about it, because I milk my cow every day. What if the machine does this for me? The reason why I mention this is, we are always good at acknowledging past progress and benefit of this, like our iPhones or our planes, or our electricity or medical supply, we we'll all love to live to 80, 80 years old, which was impossible 300 years ago. But we kind of don't play the same rule to the future. So if I look at my own job as CEO, I would say 90% of my work is repetitive. I don't enjoy it. I spend about four hours per day on stupid repetitive email, and I'm burning to have something that helps me to get rid of this. Why? Because I believe all of us are insanely creative. I think the tech community more than anybody else, but even blue-collar workers, I think you can go to your hotel maid and have a drink with him or her. And an hour later, you found a creative idea. What this would empower is to turn this creativity into action. Like, what if you could build Google in a day? What if you could sit over the beers and invent next snapshot? Whatever it is, tomorrow morning is up and running. And, and that is not science fiction. What's going to happen is, we are already in history. We are unleashed this amazing creativity by deslaving us from farming and later, of course, from factory work and have invented so many things. It's going to be even better, in my opinion, and there's going to be a great side, side effects. One of the side effects will be that things like food and medical supply and education and shelter and transportation will all become much more affordable to all of us, not just the rich people. Hmm. So when Martin Ford argued, you know, that this time is different because intelligence that uh, we've used uh, to the past uh, to find uh, found, uh, new ways to, to be well be matched at this pace by computers, taking over those things. And I hear you saying that, not completely, because of human creativity. You think that that's fundamentally different from the kind of creativity uh, that computer can do. So, does my firm believe that an AI person that I haven't seen any real progress on creativity and out-of-box thinking. What I say right now, that this is really important for people to realize. 
I, because the word artificial intelligence is so frightening, and that we have Steven Spielberg tossing a movie in where all of a sudden the computer is our overlord. But it's really technology. It's technology help us do repetitive things, and the progress has been an entirely on repetitive end. It's been a legal document discovery. It's been contract drafting. It's been screening excellence of your chest. And these things are so specialized, I don't think the big free humanity. In fact, we, are, we as people, I mean, let's face it, we've become superhuman. We've made us superhuman. We can swim across Atlantic in 11 hours. We can take a, a d d device out of our pocket and show it all the way to Australia. And in real time, have that person shouting back at me. It's physically not possible. We are breaking the rules of physics. And even this is said and done. We are going to remember everything that we ever said and said. You remember every person, which is good for me in my early stage of Azermas story. What was I saying? I forgot. <laughs> we still probably have an IQ of 1000 or more. There will be no more spelling classes for our kids because there's no spelling issue anymore. There's no math issue anymore. And I think what really will happen is that we can be super creative, and we are. We are creative, that's our secret weapon. So the jobs that are getting lost in a way, even though it's going to be painful, humans are capable of more than these jobs. And this is the dream, and the dream is that human Human can, can rise to just a few levels of empowerment and discovery. That's the dream. And think about this. If you look at the history of the humanity, that might be a whatever, 60 to 100 years old, give or take. Almost everything that you cherish in terms of invention, of technology, of things we've built, has been invented in the last 150 years. If you toss in a book and will, it's a little bit older or, or axi, but your phone, your sneakers, the cells, the modern manufacturing, penicillin, the things we cherish. Now, that to me means the next 150 years we will find more things. In fact, the piece of invention has gone up, not gone down. In my opinion, I only believe only 1% of interesting things have been invented yet, right? We haven't cured cancer, we don't have flying cars yet, yes, hopefully I'll change this. So that will be, that you, used to be an example people loved us. It's funny, isn't it? Working secretly on flying cars, we don't live twice as long yet, okay? We don't have this magic implant in our brain that gives us the information we want, that you might be a part of it, but I promise you, once you have it, you'll love it. I hope you will. It's a bit scary, I know. There are so many things we haven't invented yet that I think we'll invent, that we have no gravity shields. We can't beam ourselves from one location to another. That sounds ridiculous. But about 200 years ago, experts uh, were of the opinion that they find uh, wouldn't exist even 120 years ago. But you move faster than you could run and you would instantly die. So who says that we are correct today, that you can't beam a person from here to Mars? So Sebastian, thank you so much for the incredibly inspiring vision of your brilliance. Thank you, Sebastian. That was fantastic. Yeah, it's a fantastic presentation, and this is my second time to read it. Mm. The real problem is that uh, I have to finish reading the presentation today because it's so late today. It's about uh, half past 10 p.m. Half past 10, half past 10 o'clock at night. So see you tomorrow. Have a great night.